Dr. Donna Sherman today is going to talk about the grief pill is coming, what to know before you swallow it, a very, very timely topic right now. Dr. Donna Sherman has a 35-year history with the Dougie Center, the first bereavement center for children in the United States. She is internationally recognized an authority on grief and bereaved children, teens, and families. Donna is the author of the book, Never the Same, Coming to Terms with the Death of a Parent. She has been interviewed by numerous media outlets, including the New York Times, USA Today, and Red Book, just to name a few. Donna served on the board of directors with me at the Compassionate Friends and is actually a founding board member of the National Alliance for Children's Grief. Welcome to our, our virtual conference today, Dr. Donna Sherman. Thank you, Heidi and Gloria. It's always great to see you and to participate in this Open to Hope conference. And it's always a joy to share some things with the people who are listening here. I imagine a, a lot of people are here for the conference today because they've experienced the death of someone in their life, whether it's a, a child, a spouse, a parent, sibling, a close friend. And some of us have that experience. And we're also in the field. We're professionals who work with children who are grieving. We work with adults who are grieving. We may be chaplains, spiritual leaders, psychologists, social workers. So uh, it's it's a pleasure to speak with you today. I'm joining you from Portland, Oregon, which is the home of Dougie Center since 1982, the National Grief Center for Children and Families, where we've been serving children beginning at the age of three, up through teens, young adults, and their parents or adult caregivers. We have served more than 60,000 children and teens and young adults over these last 42 years. And I want to start out by saying grief is a natural, normal response to loss. It's natural. It's normal. It's universal. How we grieve may not be universal, but that we grieve is universal. And I would say Grief is a necessary response to loss. And there are a few things that are happening in the larger field of mental health that I think people who are grieving ought to know about. And I want to start with saying, and I'm sure that most of you have heard the term terminology complicated grief. And do I have complicated grief? What is complicated grief? And I'll just say, I believe that grief is inherently complicated. Grief is complicated because we're human and we are complicated as people and our relationships can be complicated or complex. And so when someone in our life dies, there can be complications. And you may read things that say 10% of people or 12 or eight or 22 or 35, it's all over the map in the journal articles, number of percentages of people have complicated grief. And it's my belief that the majority of us have complications related to our grief because relationships are complicated. I'll also add that even three years since the death of my mother during the pandemic where I could not be present with her. And six months later, my brother, one of two brothers dying of COVID also could not be present with him. In some ways, I am now dealing with how that has impacted me in ways that maybe I wasn't able to in the first year, two years, uh, especially since friends of mine have uh, actually uh, last month, three of my good friends' fathers died and they were able to be present with them. And it, as happy as I was for them that they could do that, it activated for me again in different ways and different levels that 
I couldn't be present with mine. And so there are lots of different ways in which we grieve and it's natural and it's normal. And there's an increasing movement to pathologize people who are grieving, to diagnose them with a fairly newly coined mental disorder called prolonged grief disorder, PGD. It was uh, placed into the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is published by the American Psychiatric Association. And it's an ever-growing book used by people who often, mostly used by people who have to give a mental disorder diagnosis in order to receive insurance reimbursement. It's a listing of mental disorders that small groups of psychiatrists and psychologists agree upon and name um, after a lot of what is uh, frequently referred to even within people in the system as horse trading. Like, I'll give you my diagnosis if you give me yours and what are we gonna call it? And for years, there was debate about whether this would be called prolonged grief disorder or complicated grief and prolonged grief disorder one. Now, even proponents of it, of this prolonged grief disorder, agree and admit that the list of symptoms, like all of the mental disorders in the DSM, are normal. And, but if after a year after your, the death, you're grieving too deeply, too intensely, or too long, your duration, you know, after a year, shouldn't be having as many problems, you may receive this diagnosis. And today I'd like to just share uh, one concerning place that this is leading. There is a study in the United States that is experimenting with treating prolonged grief disorder as an addiction. So there were prior studies, and I don't have the time today in our short time together to go into all of the factors that led to this, but I will say those factors are flawed. They looked at something like 24 women who had mothers or sisters die of breast cancer diagnosed half of them with complicated grief according to a 19 question complicated grief inventory which was developed in 1999 based on white widows in San Diego whose husbands had died after 40 some years average 40 years of marriage and they generalized to this day it's still being used generalized that uh, population to be representative of all other populations. And we know that this is a serious problem for marginalized communities, people of color, um, and to, to have your diagnosis based on a population that doesn't represent you. But anyway, this study is, is happening right now, experimenting with treating prolonged grief disorder as an addiction. That is your craving and your yearning for the person who died, partner, your child, your parent, according to these researchers, is evidence that you are addicted to the memory of the person. And to disrupt your addiction, they hypothesize, the researchers are using a drug called naltrexone, which is used to help treat opioid addiction and some other kinds of addictions. They say the point of their study is to disrupt your addiction. So naltrexone interferes with your capacity to engage in social bonding and to eliminate craving for the person who died. In the researcher's own words, and this is a quote, 
naltrexone reduces feelings of social connection, especially to one's closest others. Now, I hope that you find this troubling, as troubling as I do. And my concerns about this would certainly exceed the time limit that I have here, but I'll just mention a few things. It is bizarre that one of the symptoms listed to be in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in order to be diagnosed with prolonged grief disorder is the inability to connect with others. That's one of the symptoms of this alleged mental disorder. So a treatment that further disrupts your ability to connect with others makes no sense. It, 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 I can't find a place in my own analysis of this where this makes sense. And, and certainly, if, if you think about it, the disruption of social connections when you are grieving, sometimes for some of us happens automatically because people don't know how to deal with us. I have heard many times through parents and compassionate friends, as well as parents who've had a child die, who participate in Dougie Center groups, that sometimes they feel like tr people treat them as if losing a child having a child die is um, like catching, contagious. Uh, people have said many things about sharing in groups that they see people in a grocery store, they see that someone they know sees them, there's kind of a look of panic, like, I don't know what to do. The person gets very interested in suddenly in a, a can of green beans and then turns their cart and walks the other way. And there's a, a sense of isolation that can happen automatically when you have a child die, when someone in your life dies that was important to you, that was meaningful to you. So this disruption of social connections, which is the point of naltrexone, uh, what all complicates even further what people are experiencing as a result of the death of someone in their lives. And I would say this disruption of social connections would be likely to weigh even heavier for people who are already isolated and marginalized by mainstream or dominant society. Uh, black, indigenous, people of color, for example, those who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer, that these, these attempts to have, to, to say that you are addicted because you're yearning for the person and someone there has decided that you are yearning too deeply or too long. So I, I am 100% opposed to treating grief as addiction or treating grief with medication. Now, please don't misinterpret, excuse me, my concern as being anti-therapy or anti-counseling. Many of us, myself included, <laughs> have benefited from trauma-informed and grief-informed professionals. But I encourage you, should you seek professional help, to be cautious and to ask potential therapists what their beliefs are about grief, what they, how they address grief. Honestly, years ago, I thought the grief pill is coming. I thought it would be for depression. Turns out, the tests that have been done, the research studies that have been done about grief and depression, the antidepressants did not uh, show up as helpful or more helpful than therapy and more helpful than other things. 
So I'm not anti-therapy. I'm not anti-counseling, but I am anti-bad therapy and I am anti-bad counseling. So should you seek professional help? And it's also to, many of us can benefit from quality professional help. I'm not, I'm not against that. I'm just saying, be careful about getting prescribed now, Trexone or antidepressants, many of our families talk about when they go to their primary care physician, maybe for an annual physical, and they say, my husband died, my daughter died. Oh, let me give you a prescription for antidepressants without even uh, diving deeper. And 80% of the prescriptions for antidepressants in the United States are written by primary care physicians who don't really have the same training in antidepressants that others in the field uh, have. For more information on becoming grief informed, I invite you to visit our website and to join a campaign that we are doing to try to help people understand grief and to sort of combat this idea that you have a mental disorder because you are grieving the death of your son, the death of your child, your parent, your sibling. The uh, site is Dougie, D-O-U-G-Y dot org, D-O-U-G-Y, Dougie dot org slash understand grief. And as I close my remarks today, I want to share a quote with you it's from an article that Jerry Adler wrote in New York Magazine in 2012. And the article is called Crazy Sad. And he was responding to, at that time, 2012, here we are many years later, over a decade later, he was responding to some of the early comments that grief was going to be added as a mental disorder to the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And Jerry's son, Max, died uh, in his 20s. And he says, after Max died, friends would say they couldn't imagine what it was like for me, to which I would often respond, yes, you can. Anyone who has a child can imagine it. But now I'm not so sure, he says since it appears that professional psychiatrists are having trouble doing so. Let me put it this way, he says, if you don't experience intense yearning and longing on more days than not for more than 12 months after the death of your own child, if you don't have a diminished sense of self, you have a problem that goes deeper than anything contemplated in the DSM. There are some things in life to which one should never hope to become adjusted. I've learned that it helped me to help others, to know I'm not the only one, put one foot in front of the other, find a life. Adding hope to the darkness, you start on the trip to recovery. Reach deep down inside and say, I am gonna live on. We laugh, we cry, and remember. Hope without action doesn't work. Hope with action can change the world. We always say, if you've lost hope, please lean on ours.